Hello everyone and welcome back to this video series on acid-base balance. In this video we're going to be taking a look at the renal buffer system or the third and final system that uh, we're going to talk about in terms of uh, buffering acid and base imbalance. The renal buffer system is a more long-term buffer system. It's able to manage higher quantities of acid-base imbalance. Um, and specifically what we're going to be looking at today is how this renal buffer system manages uh, the hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions that are filtered through uh, the nephron. So when we're looking specifically at the kidney, uh, we're going to be taking a look at the glomerulus and then when we're looking at acid and base imbalance, we're most concerned about the proximal convoluted tubule and the distal convoluted tubule. Uh, so just a brief refresher as blood flows through the glomerulus or flows through Bowman's capsule, um, much of what's in the blood is filtered into the renal tubules and this filtrate passes through the renal tubules and as it does that we see reabsorption of a large amount of the electrolytes that are present in that uh, renal filtrate. So the job of the body is to uh, reabsorb as much water and electrolytes as it can while it's getting rid of the things that it doesn't necessarily need. So as we take a look at the renal buffer system, um, we're first going to be looking at the proximal convoluted tubule. And the proximal, co proximal convoluted, convoluted tubule is going to account for about 70 to 80 percent um, of acid-base balance. And the primary way that the proximal convoluted tubule is going to do this is by it extensively reabsorbs uh, bicarbonate ions. So the primary job or the primary job of this proximal convoluted tubule in acid-base balance is to recycle our bicarbonate. Uh, and if you remember from our previous video, the reason why reabsorption of bicarbonate is so important is because we have to have a higher ratio or we need to have a higher amount of bicarbonate compared to carbonic uh, or compared to car carbonic acid in order to promote buffering. So we need to have many more bicarbonate ions in order for the buffer system to actually work. So as the as the nephron is filtering things into our uh, filtrate or, and producing urine, we want to have as little bicarbonate in that urine as possible because we need to make sure that we recycle and maintain that bicarbonate in our kidneys. So as we take a look, the first thing we're going to be looking at, like I said, is the proximal convoluted tubule and how the proximal convoluted tubule is going to deal with hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions as they pass through um, the renal tubule. So what we're, be, what we're going to be looking at here to give this a bit of a breakdown, uh, this green area here is the renal tubule. This is where we're going to produce urine. These are the cells uh, of our renal tubules and then this is our blood. So essentially when we're looking at having something filtered through the kidneys or reabsorbed through the kidneys, what's going to happen is it's reabsorbed from the renal tubule through these renal cells and back into the bloodstream. Um, and that's kind of the primary way that we're going to see reabsorption occurring in the kidneys. So as we take a look or as we become concerned about acid-base balance, important thing to recognize is that both hydrogen ions and bicarbonate are filtered through the glomerulus into the renal tubule. So as we see things being filtered, we have hydrogen ions and we have bicarbonate entering the renal tubule. So we know that when we have hydrogen ions and bicarbonate together, one of the things that they can form is H2CO3. So as they combine together, they can form carbonic acid, so H2CO3. Um, and we know the next part of this is to pass through the carbonic anhydrase enzyme and produce hydrogen ions and CO2. So what's important about this proximal convoluted tubule is that carbonic anhydrase enzyme lives in the cells of the renal tubules um, or make that a different color so we can see it a little better. So the carbonic anhydrase uh, enzyme is living right here. So what it's going to help or what it's going to do, it's going to promote the movement of that carbonic acid through the renal uh, tubule cells and into the tubule cells. So through this membrane here and into the tubule cell. So as this H2CO3 moves through that carbonic anhydrase, What's going to happen is we're going to end up with H2O plus CO2. So now within those cells, we have water and carbon dioxide. As water and carbon dioxide enter these renal tubule cells, what happens is it meets 
carbonic anhydrase again. And we know that when we meet carbonic anhydrase, these two things will now be able to form uh, H2CO3. So we have the formation of H2CO3, which is going to lead to the formation of, again, hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions. And at this point, many students get confused about, well, if I started with hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions, why am I just taking this system all the way back to create more hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions? And the reason for this is that if we just left the hydrogen and bicarbonate up in this area in the renal tubule, you're going to pee both of them out. By taking this, these hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions, running them through this carbonic anhydrase system twice, and having hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions end up on the inside of these renal tubule cells, we can now use a couple mechanisms to get rid of hydrogen ions while keeping bicarbonate ions. So one of the things that's going to happen to our hydrogen ions is we're going to use a number of mechanisms to get rid of them or to get them, put them back in the renal tubule and pee them out uh, through our urine. So one of the things that hap is going to happen is we have an ATPase or an ATP pump that's going to pump this hydrogen ion back into the renal tubule. So one thing we're going to see is hydrogen ions will now be moved back into the renal tubule through an ATP pump. The other thing that we may see is the exchange of sodium uh, for these hydrogen ions. So as we have sodium in our filtrate, we can bring sodium into these renal tubule cells and exchange them for these hydrogen ions. So there's two mechanisms that we have uh, to get rid of hydrogen. We can use an ATPase to get rid of the hydrogen ions, or we can use a sodium exchanger to exchange sodium for hydrogen ions. And again, we're getting rid of that acid through our urine. So one of the functions of the proximal convoluted tubule is to use this ATP exchanger or, to, or ATPase or this sodium exchanger to get rid of hydrogen ions. So now we've pushed that hydrogen back into the renal tubule and we can pee it out. Now, just like we seen previously in our blood cells, what we can do with this HCO3 to get it into the blood is exchange it for another negatively charged ion. So what we see is HCO3 now moves into our blood where we want it. And as a result, just like in our uh, red blood cells, we have a chloride shift where we put chloride ions into the cell to maintain uh, the negative charge. So we exchange bicarbonate for chloride ions, and now we've put bicarbonate back into our bloodstream. So if you think about the importance of that is if we, when we started up in stage one here, when we had hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions entering the filtrate, if we just left it here, these two ions would get peed out and we would lose this bicarbonate. By creating carbonic acid, going through carbonic anhydrase to produce H2O plus CO2, again creating carbonic acid and go, going through the carbonic anhydrase system to produce H plus and HCO3, within these renal tubule cells, I can use the mechanisms in place within these renal tubule cells to get rid of hydrogen ions through either the ATPase or our sodium exchanger, or, uh, or additionally, I can use my bicarbonate uh, chloride shift in order to get bicarbonate back into the bloodstream and exchange it for chloride ions. So this is how the proximal convoluted tubule does a really good job of performing that primary function acid-base balance. And that primary function is to maintain or recycle all these levels of bicarbonate. In the process, we're also getting rid of hydrogen ions, which helps uh, decrease the chance of acidosis. Um, and we're also promoting buffering by maintaining these high levels of bicarbonate. So again, if you remember what we talked about uh, in the first video is we need these high levels of bicarbonate to promote buffering. Uh, so again, by increasing these levels, we're promoting buffering further uh, in the bloodstream. Now, if these mechanisms fail or this doesn't work, this is how you can get something called uh, renal tubule acidosis type 2. So if this process fails and we start peeing out lots of bicarbonate ions, we lose that import, important ratio um, of bicarbonate ions to ca carbonic acid. Um, and as a result, the body becomes much more acid, uh, acidotic. So this is the way the proximal convoluted tubule is going to manage acid-base balance. So now that we understand how the proximal convoluted tubule is going to play a role in acid-base balance, we should take a look at how the distal convoluted tubule is going to uh, pick up the rest of uh, the responsibility for acid-base balance. 
So generally what we're seeing is uh, the distal convoluted tubule is responsible for about 20 to 30 percent reabsorption uh, of our bicarbonate or uh, 20 to 30 percent of our bicarbonate recycling. Uh, as you know from our previous talk on the proximal convoluted tubule, the main way that the kidneys are going to manage acid-base balance uh, is to manage how we recycle bicarbonate or how we maintain that uh, ratio of bicarbonate to carbonic acid. So when we're taking a look at the, prox or the distal convoluted tubule, we're pretty much looking at uh, a very similar uh, layout. So again, obviously we have a renal tubule, uh, we have intercalated cells, and then we have our uh, bloodstream. Specifically, when we're talking about the distal convoluted tubule, we're going to be talking about it two different types of cells. So we're either going to be talking about the intercalated cells type A or intercalated cells type B. And these cells perform two fairly significant roles in terms of acid-base balance. So as we outline the role of our intercalated cells, uh, in the initial aspects or the initial areas of acid-base balance, these cells don't look particularly different or the role of these cells don't look particularly different from what we've seen in our proximal convoluted tubule. So we know that our filtrate is going to contain H plus plus HCO3 negative. Hopefully by the time we've made it to our uh, distal convoluted tubule we have um, less HCO3 in the renal uh, filtrate. Uh, because we should have reabsorbed a large amount of that into the blood, but obviously some is still going to be present. So it looks very similar to our previous uh, explanation. So that's going to turn to H2CO3. It's going to respond to carbonic, uh, a carbonic anhydrase enzyme on the intercalated cell membrane. So again, we have carbonic anhydrase living on this membrane. That's going to allow us to move that H2CO3 through the membrane into the intercalated cell and form H2O plus CO2. Again, we're going to see the exact same thing ha happen now. So that H2, H2O H2O plus CO2 is going to turn into H2CO3 followed by H plus plus bicarb or HCO3 negative. So the important part of this intercalated cell type A is how we're actually going to manage um, getting rid of those hydrogen ions. We don't see a lot of difference in terms of how we manage the bicarbonate in these cells, but the way we manage the hydrogen uh, ions is slightly different. So what's happening in these cells is we're going to get rid of hydrogen ions through the typical way which we talked about before. So that's the use of an ATPase. But what we're also going to see on the membrane of this cell is a potassium hydrogen exchanger. So what that means is in these intercalated cells type A, what we're also going to do is bring potassium in or exchange potassium. Uh, so bring potassium into the cell and move hydrogen ions out of the cell. So one of the key differences here is instead of using sodium as the exchanger, uh, these intercalated cells type A in the distal convoluted tubule are going to use potassium uh, in order to exchange for hydrogen ions. So obviously we're still seeing that ATPase kicking hydrogen ions out into the renal uh, tubule or into our filtrate, but we're also seeing the use or we're also seeing uh, the exchange of uh, potassium for hydrogen ions. So potassium is entering these cells while hydrogen ions are exiting these cells. And one thing that I want you guys to consider while we're looking at this is obviously changes in acid base balance or changes in electrolyte balance can play a role here. So think about how things like hyperkalemia or acidosis are going to interact with each other and how they're going to relate to specific changes in uh, or electrolyte changes can relate to specific changes in acid base and acid base can relate to changes in uh, electrolyte. Now when we're looking at our bicarbonate uh, ion here, nothing's changing. So this bicarbonate ion is still being exchanged for chloride. So we're putting bicarbonate back into our bloodstream and we're exchanging that for a chloride ion. So nothing is changing here. Um, so we're still performing that crucial role of uh, bicarbonate exchange. So this uh, is the secondary way in which we're going to recycle our bicarbonate. And that's how our intercalated type A cells work.
um, when we have intercalated type A cells that aren't working func uh, functionally or they're not working appropriately, this is how we can get a renal tubular acidosis um, type 1. So these are two ways that you can see someone becoming extremely acidotic from renal problems um, is by dysfunction of the cells in their proximal convoluted tubule or dysfunction of their cells in the distal convoluted tubule. Finally, what I'd like to talk about is the intercalated cells type B. Um, basically, what we've talked a lot about in these two systems that we've explained here, the intercalated cells type A and the cells of the proximal convoluted tubule, is how we're going to get more bicarbonate into our bloodstream and get hydrogen into the urine and pee it out so that we are basically preventing acidosis. But what is the body going to do when we enter an alkalotic state or as we mentioned, the renal buffer system does a good job at buffering both acids and bases. So in a alkalotic state, what is the body going to do? So if we take a look, again, things are working exactly the same here. So um, in the intercalated cells uh, type B, we have H plus plus HCO3 in the renal two, uh, filtrate. It's obviously going to change to H2CO3 it's going to shift through, um, uh, again, through that carbonic anhydrase that's located on the cell membrane. And as a result, it's going to turn into H2O plus CO2. We know that that's going to shift into H2CO3 through another carbonic anhydrase and produce H plus plus HCO3 negative. So again, this is the exact same equation that we're seeing over and over again, but it is happening over and over again in these cells. Now the difference uh, in this intercalated cell type B is that the roles are switched. So we see the exchangers uh, looking quite different on this side of the cell. So instead of taking hydrogen ions and pushing, pushing them out into the renal tubule or into the urine, what happens is this intercalated cell type B is responsible for bringing hydrogen ions back into the bloodstream. So we see a number of different types of exchangers here. So we have a sodium and hydrogen exchanger on this side of the membrane, so between the blood and the uh, intercalated cell. We actually see uh, an exchanger that's responsible for pushing uh, sodium into this cell and exchanging that for hydrogen. So we actually see hydrogen levels increasing in the bloodstream. We also see a potassium exchanger similar to what we saw on the other side of the cell. Uh, so it actually is responsible for pushing potassium into the cell and exchanging that for hydrogen and putting more hydrogen into our bloodstream. As well as we actually see an ATP pump that's specifically responsible or an ATPase that's responsible for putting hydrogen ions into the bloodstream. So there's a clear distinction between what we're seeing in the intercalated cells type A and intercalated cells type B. Intercalated cells type A are primarily responding to acidosis and what they're going to do is they're going to help uh, reabsorb bicarbonate or recycle bicarbonate and get rid of hydrogen ions. Whereas our intercalated cells type B are responsible for responding to alkalosis or as we get too much bicarbonate and too little hydrogen ions, um, it's responsible for bringing that pH back down lower. And you can see how if we have two cells performing opposite functions, they can work to balance each other out. So one can act as the negative feedback for the other um, so that we manage an appropriate pH in our bloodstream. The other difference that we're going to see with our intercalated cells type B is that instead of having uh, an exchanger here that's accepting bicarbonate ions, um, we're going to see the opposite. So chloride ions are actually pulled in from the uh, renal filtrate and we start to see bicarbonate being peed out or being pushed out into our renal tubule. So the opposite in this uh, intercalated cell type B is that bicarbonate is being pushed out into the urine or being pushed out into the renal filtrate in exchange for chloride ions and we're seeing hydrogen ions being reabsorbed into the bloodstream uh, in exchange for things like sodium, potassium. Um, so it's a truly an opposite function to what we're seeing uh, when we're trying to fix an acidosis problem.
the last thing I'd like to mention as we're looking at asset base balance is what actually is going to happen as we put all of this hydrogen ion or we put all these hydrogen ions into the renal filtrate. So if the kidneys are doing their uh, job appropriately and our distal convoluted tubule and proximal convoluted tubule are working together appropriately, we should start to see a large amount of hydrogen ions starting to build up in our renal filtrate, or we start to see a large amount of uh, protons in this renal filtrate because if we look at what's happening in uh, the proximal convoluted tubule here is we're shifting again hydrogen ions into the urine uh, as well as in the intercalated A cells we're also seeing hydrogen ions being pushed into urine and the problem is that having an excessive amount of hydrogen ions can cause issues because we're decreasing the pH of the urine and we know that as things become excessively more acidic they start to damage proteins in cells so one of the ways that we're going to need to manage this is having a buffer system within the kidney that is going to allow for safe transport of these hydrogen ions outside of the cell. And the way that the body primarily does that is through uh, NH3 and uh, HPO4. So what we see is NH3, which is actually a byproduct of uh, glutamate within the body, so glutamate is broken down into NH3, and what can happen is a hydrogen ion can bind to this NH3, forming NH4, and as a result, this can kind of stabilize or manage the uh, acidotic environment that's resulting as a result of all these hydrogen ions, and we can pee, pee out the NH4. Uh, as I mentioned before, we also have HPO4, or phosphate, which can also accept one of these hydrogen ions, and as a result, we get H2PO4. And we utilize those mechanisms uh, in order to get those hydrogen ions out of our system in our urine without having extremely uh, acidic urine. So again, just to recap, what we're looking at here is our proximal convoluted tubule does about 70 to 80% of the reabsorption of the bicarbonate ions that's required in order to promote buffering and have acid-base balance. Um, what we see is uh, a complex system where we utilize the bicarbonate buffer system uh, to exchange hydrogen ions for uh, hydrogen ions and bicarbonate and put hydrogen ions into the renal tubule while putting our bicarbonate ions into the blood. The proximal convoluted tubule, again, is where we see the majority of this happening, but we also use our distal convoluted tubule to balance uh, the remaining 20-30% of bicarbonate reabsorption, or we use that distal convoluted tubule in order to manage acid-base balance when we start to see an alkalotic environment occurring in the blood.